are supposed to reflect who Jesus is. We are supposed to be a reflection of His love, His mercy, and His grace, and the redeeming power of who He is. So when we speak, when we act, when we associate ourselves with anything, when we align ourselves with any value, we must ask ourselves, does this reflect who Jesus is, what He came to do, and what His purpose was? Because we are no longer our own. We have been bought with a price, and we are now reflections of who Jesus is, rather than having our own values, our own ideas, our own philosophies, we allow Scripture and who Jesus is to inform what we believe, what we think, and what we do. And that's true no matter what country you're in, that's true no matter what uh, nationality you are, that's true no matter what color you are, that's true no matter what gender you are. You are a reflection of Jesus. And so we're going to talk about how we should rightfully think about a few topics. And we're going to ask ourselves, does what I'm saying, how I'm behaving, and what I align myself reflect and embody the work of Christ? That's what we're going to be asking ourselves. That's the reflection we're going to take. For all of us, this will be a lifelong struggle. I don't care how long you've been serving Christ. We are inundated constantly with information. We live in a 24-hour news cycle. We have Facebook, we have TikTok, we have Instagram, we have Pinterest, we have the internet right at our fingers with our phone. We can look at anything we decide to. And more often than not, we are insulating ourselves from other ideas. We connect with people who think like us, who believe like us, who speak like us, and we can reinforce some bad habits. Last week, Pastor uh, Wilson talked a lot about one voice and how he, he pointed out that if we align ourselves with any one movement, we are going to miss the point because all of them will be lacking in some way. And he wasn't pointing out a particular group. He was saying anything that doesn't embody the work of Jesus that we align ourselves with, we have to understand is fundamentally flawed on some level. So we as Christians must make sure that even, if, even in the event that we are going after a cause that is Christ-like, but it's attached to something that isn't backed by Scripture, there are going to be things that we disagree with, and we need to make it clear that we don't stand with those things. And it's a delicate balance. Because as we see this week, we're going to talk about being an ambassador. And part of being an ambassador is representing the ideas and positions of the country that you're from, while at the same time keeping a good relationship with the citizenry and the leadership of the place that you're in so that you can be effective at your job. And so over the course of the next five weeks, we are going to allow Scripture to challenge our views. We're going to allow Scripture to speak into our lives, and we're going to question whether or not we've allowed anything to influence our worldview. We're going to let Scripture say to us, okay, this is what God feels about it, this is what His Word says about it, and yet we are slightly off course, and we are going to have the opportunity to have our course corrected. And that's true for me, I have been challenged by this series as I've helped put it together. Um, I find myself uh, being too quick to jump onto certain things and, and not quick enough to jump onto other things. And so I've been challenged by this, and I pray that uh, all of us will be honest in our assessment of ourselves and look at our viewpoints, our heart, and our actions and how we deal with others and truly ask ourselves is how I'm behaving, how I'm speaking, what I'm doing, does it reflect who I believe Jesus to be? So the gospel of Jesus has to inform our identity. Before we are anything else, we are children of God. We are His servants. We belong to Him. So He is our primary identity. Not our failings, not our successes, not any organization that we can affiliate ourselves with. It is strictly Jesus that informs our identity. And so when we 
talk about who Jesus is and we reflect on what he is, um, our goal should never be to be morally superior. Our goal should never be to just have the right information about stuff. And if you don't agree with it, well then forget you. I'm going to bully you until you acknowledge it or just don't talk to me anymore. The goal, the purpose of everything that we do is to win people to the gospel. If that can't be said of what we're doing, then we must ask ourselves why we are doing it. And this will play out in different ways. You don't have to be a minister of, uh, of a church in order for that to be the case. You can be a business owner. You can be passionate about certain uh, parts of society that you get involved with, but you must make sure that when you're acting, your actions reflect that of Christ. So with that in mind, let us begin by reading what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He, it was his apparently his third letter to the church in Corinth, he gives us two goals to live up to. Two. We are to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus and to have the ministry of reconciliation. The Holy Spirit alive in us, the reflection of Jesus, the work that He has done, that is to bring back people to a relationship with God that He originally envisioned. So let's Let's read 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 21. We'll read the whole chapter and then we'll, we'll talk about it together. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, t- tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desire to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we... Uh, shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend uh, not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance, and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause." For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, and that which should live not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know him no more. Therefore, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let us pray for the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for the words that were penned by Paul so many years ago 
for our edification, for our benefit. We pray that you would use them now to guide and direct our life in every aspect. We ask for wisdom and guidance. And Lord, open our hearts to receive it with joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Paul starts by talking about the tabernacle. And in the last chapter, if you go and read it, you will see that he was talking about um, the, the light afflictions that we experience in this life are to bring permanent glory in us. And so he's talking about in light of that, because of that, this tabernacle, this body that we dwell in, another way of saying it is like a tent. It's a temporary dwelling. It is not permanent. It is a tabernacle in the wilderness of sorts. It's bringing the glory of God to bear in us. The things that we're experiencing now, the hardships, the ups and downs, they're all designed to bring us closer to who God is. So when we experience all of the things that we are in our society, the things that bring turmoil and chaos and don't seem to offer peace, those are to drive us closer to God so that we may know him better. And he's making the point that these are temporary dwellings. These are not our permanent homes. Therefore, the things that are associated with this life, the causes, the creeds, the, the political parties, the nations even, ultimately won't matter because one day all of those things are going to pass away. One day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. We will have new bodies, and everything will be under Christ Jesus. And so everything now is to prepare us for that time. So if we get too caught up in the affairs of this life, we're missing the ultimate point. However, as Christians, there are certain things that we should not tolerate. And so for this series, we're going to talk about a few of them. We're going to talk about next week the concern for the poor. Uh, then we're going to talk about racial injustice, confronting that, what the Bible says about it. Then we're going to talk about life being precious. And what does Scripture say about life, and how should we view life, and what do we do as a response to that? And then lastly, we're going to talk about sexual intimacy. And in all of those things, we're not going to seek to condemn anyone. We're not going to seek to bash anyone. All we're going to do is say, what does Scripture say? How does it inform our view? And then, in light of who Jesus is, how do I respond? That will be the goal. And so the first week is to set up the idea that we are the ambassadors of God, that we have a purpose, that we cannot represent our own ideologies, we cannot allow the ideologies of any group of individuals in this life to dictate how we think and believe, but rather we let Scripture do that. And I'm going to say that several times during this message because we struggle with it. I struggle with it. We allow the things that we're inundated with to shift us ever so slightly. So he talks about this exchange for the temporary, for the permanent. And then look, take a look at verse 9. He says, we labor that whether present or absent from the Lord, we may be accepted of him. What does that mean? What does it mean that we labor to be accepted of the Lord? Does that mean that we're trying to earn our salvation? Does that mean we're trying to find a way to be acceptable before God? No. Because it's talking about even in His presence, we will labor to be accepted of Him. It's talking about the idea that we want to do what pleases God. We want to do what pleases God. We want to... Um, have our home be in Christ. We will be face to face with Him one day. He will speak and we will do. And the difference between now and then is that now requires faith. Now requires endurance. And now requires um, courage because there will come a time when we're in front of Jesus. You don't need faith to believe in Jesus. He's right there. You won't need to operate through hardship because there will be no more hardship. There will be no more pain, no more sorrows. We will be in perfection. And therefore, now we walk by faith, not by sight. So the accepting 
that God is talking about is us doing the will of God. Not because we're trying to earn anything, but because we are who He says we are. Our identity is tied to Him. Jesus behaved a certain way, therefore we have to behave a certain way to show that we have been changed by the Holy Spirit. The things that we do, all of them, good or bad, will be judged by God. Christ, in His perfection, will look at our works and judge them. How we treated people, how we talked to people, how we connected ourselves uh, with things will all be judged. So yeah, when you went off on a tirade on that one person because they don't think like you, that's going to be judged. When I uh, seek not to understand but to be understood, yeah, that's going to be judged. So the question we must ask ourselves is, do those things please God? Better, a better question might be this. How do we know if those things are pleasing to God? How do we know? Uh, let's skip down to verse 14 for a minute where he says, The love of Christ constraineth us. Or put another way, the love of Christ controls us. The motivation behind everything we do has to be the love of Jesus. If you want to know whether or not you are inside the will of God or not, ask yourself, what is the motivating factor behind what you do? Is it pride? Is it uh, to you know, extol your own virtues, to show other people how smart you are? Or is it so that they can be connected to the love of Jesus? That has to be the question. When the love of God gets a hold of our hearts, it compels us to pour out our lives for other people. It compels us. It constrains us. Our main focus, our goal in mind is to be of use. It is to be a servant to all. Paul said it like this. He said, I am a debtor to Greeks and Jews, to barbarian, to free. He's a debtor because he knows the love of Jesus. And therefore, if he knows the love of Jesus, then he is compelled to share it with other people. And until he does, he owes them something. If we are in Christ, then everything that we are has passed away. Everything. The grace of God is an invading force into our soul that will not let any place in our heart go untouched. So if you're willing to have biblical views, then you know that the grace of God is controlling your heart. If you resist those biblical views, you must ask yourself, what am I not surrendering to God? To live is Christ, to die is gain. If we're not living for ourselves, we live for Him, that means we give up our rights. I have a right to be treated a certain way. I have a right to be spoken to a certain way. I have a right to be respected. I have a right for these things. But I give up those rights for the benefit of others. Because if I be disrespected, but I'm able to win that person to Christ, then thanks be to God. He calls us ambassadors. When an ambassador is doing his job well, he is only representing the one that sent him. He doesn't get to choose what he will or won't represent. He speaks and behaves only as instructed by the one that sent him. This week there will be a supplemental teaching on ambassadors. It will go out via email. It will go on the Facebook page that has more in-depth idea of what an ambassador, what their roles and responsibilities are. It's really interesting. I, I hope that you will uh, read that and talk it over with yourselves um, and find fellowship in that. But um, we find ourselves like John. You, John the Baptist was sent before Christ. He was called the greatest prophet. And yet, this is what we find him saying in John chapter 3, verse 30. He says, He must increase, but I must decrease. 
So John's ministry was incredibly important. He was the forerunner. He was prophesied about. The Bible calls him the greatest of the prophets. And yet, he understood that as Christ came to prominence, he had to decrease. And we have to make sure that we're not putting our personal ministries, our personal projects, our personal uh, ideologies ahead of who Jesus and his work is. They may be great things. All of the things that we're going to talk about, serving the poor, fighting racial injustice, the sanctity of human life, and, and sexual morality, all of those things are hugely important. But if those become our primary focus, rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we have missed the mark. All of it has to be rooted in first the spirit that gives life, not the letter that kills. Amen? We have to remember that ultimately our goal is reconciliation. Have you ever um, been in the middle of two people who were arguing about something, they were fighting about something, and then you were able to mediate between them and be able to bring them back together? That's reconciliation. And the reason why we need to be, have the ministry of reconciliation is all of us were the enemies of God. And there are some who are still the enemies of God. There is a war taking place that is spiritual. It is not physical. The things that you're seeing the, in people that you disagree with and, and that you find not helpful, those things are not the issue. The heart is the issue. The spirit in them is the issue. And the war that they have against God without even knowing it is the real problem. And when they can become at peace with their Creator, all of the other things start to fade away. And the way we treat others gets better, and the way we view things gets better. But the thing is, you can't expect them to live as a citizen of your country until they are a citizen of your country. What we're supposed to be doing is not be right. It's not to have all the answers. It is to minister grace unto the hearers. We find that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. And when I say the goal isn't to be right, I mean it isn't enough to win an argument. What I mean is it isn't enough to simply be correct in the assessment of the situation. You can be right all day long and still be wrong because of how you approach the situation. How do we meet people where they are and bring the grace of God to them? That's the question we have to ask ourselves daily. How, what opportunity does this situation afford for me to bring the grace of God into their life and get to talk to them about Jesus? Because guess what? A lot of the things that people are trying to attach themselves with, the causes that they are passionate about, God is passionate about those too, but He can perform those way better than they can on their own. So when you see people who are for racial justice, that's a good thing because God is for racial justice. But God can accomplish that way better than whatever means that they're seeking to on their own. God has a heart for the poor. And so if somebody has a deep concern for the poor and, and wants to make that happen, that's great. Invite them into the grace of Jesus because God can perform that way better than they can. All of these things give us a platform, an opportunity to speak the love of Jesus into people's life. We find the common ground, the things that we can agree on, and we work towards that. Jesus sat with sinners. He listened to them. He had such a good relationship with them that he was accused of being a sinner himself. Do we have good relationships with people that we disagree with? Would they say that they can feel our love towards them if we don't necessarily share their platform or opinion? I can speak for myself that at times the answer is no. And so I have work to do. And I believe that you do too. 
A group of people that always said the right thing were the Pharisees. The Pharisees always were saying the right thing. As a matter of fact, Jesus told people, I think it was in uh, Matthew, he said, do what the Pharisees say, but don't do what they do. Their teaching is right. The things that they, they talk about, yeah, that's absolutely correct, but the way that they live, that's not correct. Sometimes we can be very much like the Pharisees in how we approach the truth of God. We don't abandon it. We don't water it down. We don't excuse it or say, oh, that's okay. We don't make concessions. But we try to minister it with grace, not to destroy. The Bible says that we're supposed to use the Word of God like a two-edged sword. And when, when the Bible talks about that, that two-edged sword, it's a small like dagger-like thing. It's supposed to be surgical in its precision. It's not broad and hitting the broad strokes. It is supposed to go in and perform uh, in close quarters. One question that we need to ask ourselves constantly is do we want to win an argument or do we want to win a soul? It's an important question. I think sometimes we want to win the argument more. But if we are in Christ and everything has been passed away and who we are has been nailed to the cross and we're new creatures, we don't live for that anymore. And when we do, we repent and we present our bodies a living sacrifice again. And we ask for forgiveness and we seek to reconcile. Paul calls us ambassadors, which means um, we get to represent what His will is. And we don't choose what we represent. Part of doing a good job as an ambassador is having a good relationship to who you've been sent to. So, can you be a good ambassador if you're abrasive and obnoxious, a know-it-all, and always have to be right? Is that going to go over well with the people that you're there to develop a relationship with? I don't think it will. I think it will cause a problems. An ambassador is also called a diplomat. And they're called a diplomat because they are a person who is diplomatic in their approach to things. He is able to understand the culture and the language of the country they're assigned to, but represent the views, beliefs, and laws of their native land. And often an ambassador seeks to help make the laws and things in that country better, but always remembers that it's not his job to change the country he's in. He's there to develop good relationships with the country that he's in. We change the law of a person's life by having them come into the kingdom of God. My heart, your heart, is the sovereign kingdom of Jesus Christ. And when somebody comes to the knowledge of Jesus, they become the sovereign land of Jesus Christ. That's how we change the world. It doesn't mean that we ignore things, but our main point is to bring reconciliation between people and God. As we live and we go among those that God has called us to be ambassadors to and be the minister of reconciliation, let us look to serve, to seek first to understand. I know it's not easy. It's, it's complicated at times because even to hold some of the views that we do as Christians because of Scripture, we're considered intolerant and bigoted, and we are falsely accused. And it's hard to know where to stand up and when to hold peace. It's hard to know when to uh, minister grace in the sense of forgiveness and minister grace in the sense of correction. It isn't that we never correct. It isn't that we never point out sin. 
But the point is not to just point out the sin. The, the point of the, to do it is to get them to recognize that they need help and that there is a Savior who has come to give them that help. I'd like to encourage us all with one last scripture. And Paul writes to us in the uh, first letter we have to the church in, in Corinth and writes about the relationship of the church and them that are without. And so in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9-13, through 13, this is what Paul writes. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to, com- not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetousness, or ex- extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you, not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person." So Paul evidently had written another letter that we don't have um, available to us that he previously said, hey, look, if if people are having sex outside of marriage, they're being drunkards, they're doing these things, you need to not hang out with those people. But Paul's like, I wasn't talking about the people who weren't of this world. I was talking about people who are inside the body of Christ who continue to do those things, who are warned against them and continue to do them anyway. And he says, why am I worried about that? Because the outside world judges what's going on. We set an example for the world. Sometimes we are harsher on the outside world than we are inside the house of God. But the Bible says that judgment begins at the house of God. So how are we behaving amongst ourselves? How are we addressing the issues that we see inside the church that causes people to look at uh, a Christian and go, why would I want to be a part of that? They're looking at our behavior. They're looking at our love for one another. They're looking how we talk and behave towards one another. Just one example, we allow our differences in different circles of Christianity to cause us to attack each other. Do we have to agree? No, but why are we being bitterly fighting over these ideas? I'm reminded when Paul was in prison and and he was told that other people were preaching the gospel and they were doing it to harm him. They didn't necessarily believe what they were saying. They didn't necessarily agree with it, but they were doing it because the more the gospel went out, the more Paul seemed to get punished. And they're like, this seems like a good plan to me. And Paul said, let it be done. Sometimes we're too busy fighting in the minutia to allow the love of Jesus to be seen. It isn't that those things aren't important and that they don't need to be talked about, but how we address them matters just as much as that we address them. If we are mean-spirited, if we are harsh, if we are uncaring in our presentation of these things, that's not a wisdom that comes from God. James says that's a wisdom that comes from the devil himself. My prayer for us this morning that we would be better ambassadors for Jesus. That we would represent his interests in such a way that they are heard. And that we would behave as he instructed us. Next week we're going to look at a passage in Matthew where Jesus talked about um, at the end where he would separate the sheep and the goats. And he says that those who did it to the least of them did it also to him. And those that didn't do it unto the least of them did it not unto him. And then he says to the ones that did it to the least, enter into the joy of the Lord. And to the ones that didn't, to go away into everlasting punishment. How we treat people matters. 
it is a reflection of whether or not we have the grace of God in our hearts. So yes, let's make sure that we are right in our doctrine. Let's make sure that we are thinking correctly on all of these issues. But more importantly, let's make sure that we are right in how we address these matters. We are on a rescue mission seeking to bring hope to those who are without hope. The brokenness, the hurts, and the wounds that are in this world are displayed in all kinds of ways. There's a saying that says, hurt people, hurt people. So we address the wounds, we address the hurts, and we um, bring grace to the hearers. So may we go forward this week and seek to be better at representing Christ's views and not representing our own. May we seek to um, have Scripture inform our ideologies and to shape our worldview, and let us not get off track or off base in any of those things. I love you guys. Thank you for joining us this morning. We will see you guys next week. There will be a contact us screen up if you need to reach us for any reason. Thank you.